Hello and welcome to Virtual Thoughts, episode number six, where I'm here with Greg Ness, the VP of Worldwide Product Marketing at Cloud Velox. Tell us a little bit about Cloud Velox, Greg. Uh, we're a uh, about a four-year-old uh, software company. Uh, we automate a lot of the critical processes from discovery to provisioning to blueprinting to synchronization for mixed virtual or physical environments into infrastructure as a service. So we address a lot of the pain points around the early adoption of cloud for legacy apps, um, the discovery processes, the provisioning, uh, the network and security services that are extended. We automate a lot of those processes. And so we reduce the time, cost and risk typically associated with deploying either hybrid cloud, you know, cloud for DR or migrating an environment uh, into the cloud just for operation, like for apps with uh, unpredictable workloads. So part of this, I, I see a couple of different parts with, with going to the cloud, and we've talked about IT transformation in the past with a few other companies. I, but when we start talking about, okay, they made a decision, let's go, the discovery part is huge because yeah. you need to know what your applications are, all the dependencies before you can move anything. And if you don't know, just moving one, VM or one host up to a cloud means you now have a nightmare of, of setting up layered networks and so forth. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. And we, about last year, there was a Fortune 600 company that we were talking to and they had an estimate of taking a six or seven terabyte Oracle e-commerce stack um, in AWS. And they had an estimate of 300,000 bucks, six months, and a lot of it was discovery. Uh, there's Indeca, CQ5, a lot going on. Um, we automated a lot of those processes and we had them up and running in AWS in under a week. Um, clearly there were still manual processes. They had security audits, compliance audits, all of that. Um, out of those seven days, probably three days were manual processes. It still remained, but we had shrunk it down from you know 90 days and hundreds of thousands of dollars to three or four days of manual process. So, but how do you do the discovery? Is it more approach of like, just do a network sniff and find everything that talks to everything else? Or are you like more embedded in the application? How, how are you doing this? There's a number of different ways to do this. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a mixed process. And uh, part of it is uh, secret sauce and how we do it. Um, we think we're the only people to do it well with a high level of automation for mixed environments. Um, when you're in a virtualized infrastructure on the cloud, discovery is much easier. And there's you know, a group of solutions that work fairly well for those type of environments. But when you add in the physical systems, yes, you're looking at route tables, you're looking at all kinds of aspects of the application and the workloads. Um, we did a very large enterprise uh, application that had 120 mount points. Um, it took us eight hours to put that on the cloud and probably three hours of discovery with our automation, yet there was still so much going on that there was you know, some manual process involved. Okay. But they had budgeted two weeks of time for the proof of concept, which we took eight hours for. So- Yeah, um, automation, is, automation is king when you're talking about the cloud. Now, after you do your, automate, your, do your discovery, the next thing is to come up with a blueprint and architecture, because you're going to have to review it before you put it out there. That's right. Now, I'm assuming your tool, I mean, Cloud Velox has the capability to show that to me, but I think the future of that is discovery plus seeding a blueprint application of some form to allow me to modify it on the fly with what I really want. Right now, people either have to create a blueprint by hand, yeah. which is kind of foolish. Yeah. Or they try to get data from other sources that aren't really good at it, Again, kind of foolish. I would love to see in the future tools like yours seed a blueprint tool, like kind of create a Tosca graph or some sort of common format that allow me to seed any blueprint tool, whoever's it is. Yeah. And then use that same blueprint and graph to seed my performance management tools, to seed my other operational management tools with, this is the application, folks. This is the dependencies. This is what you should be looking at. Is I, when you go down the path of putting stuff in the cloud, people say just putting it up there is not good enough. 
I got to be able to monitor it. I got to be able to know what I'm looking at. And as I make improvements, I need to actually change the architecture. If I don't have what you put there, all those steps will fail that are later on. Yeah, and so I would say that would be a great point where for an and or our VP of products. And so I'm on the VP of marketing side, but we haven't gotten a lot. So we integrate on the database side with, you know, data guard, our, our man and things like that that allow you to create and update, you know, data slaves in the cloud. Um, and we audit, we haven't gotten a lot of requests yet for integration of blueprinting, but I think it's a great idea. Um, we're seeing people with the economics of getting in the cloud and operating so compelling that they may make some sacrifices in that area, but they're compensating for it um, with the view of the application across the environment, both behind the firewall and in the cloud. Um, and, and having that from an application standpoint, that mixed environment, um, seems to be quite compelling, uh, but I do see a time where we integrate with different tools and in business information analytics, and we've had conversations with some of those companies. Yeah, because, um, I mean, just getting into the cloud doesn't mean much. I mean, I, anybody can get it to the cloud. It may take a long time. It's sometimes very manual or it's incredibly automated, yeah. but now what do you do? Okay, I can run it day to day, but if, what happens if I need to add something new in? Yeah. And that's, well, when, you, when you start looking at the future, trajectory of everything that you're doing, the future trajectory is basically using that blueprint to seed everything going forward. You want yeah. a new architecture, here's the old blueprint. How do you want to modify it to add in those 16 new services? I can then use that blueprint to feed my Jenkins server, which would actually do the, do the third generation of uh, programming that Pivotal is all about and, and the next and the Jenkins folks are all about and the Vagrant folks are all about. I can then use that to see that and it says, okay, I got all this, don't need to worry about it. I added these 16 new services and boom, it goes out and now everybody's happy. Yeah, no, I, and I think that's the ultimate, you know, holy grail for the hybrid cloud environment. And Absolutely. I think today we're dealing with, you know, the repressed demand for applications that, for example, are running in a secondary data center. Yeah. Um, that's costing thirty to fifty thousand dollars a month, and they're not testing it very often because of the configuration requirements and the technical uh, issues. Um, if the data center is in another state, then they're either having to deploy staff there or to fly people there for testing. And then when they're testing, things are broken, things haven't been configured and updated. So we're kind of addressing the ability to reduce the cost of protecting an app while increasing the protection of that application. So the and more immediate, the more immediate yeah, thing. Yeah, which is, is replacing a data center uh, and avoiding a hardware refresh and then increasing the uh, ability or, or, or increasing the ability of someone to test their environment on a quarterly basis, making it very easy through APIs and automation. So our, our use case is really conducive to you know, people whose disaster recovery as a service contracts are running up or who have that facility and now they're looking at another three to five year commitment. And when they do the math, for example, uh, my points, um, they shuttered a data center that was in Nevada um, that was costing them about 30 to 50 K a month. And they reduced their cost in half, but more importantly, what their goal was, was to be able to test their environment every three months, which they had not been able to do with like the traditional model. Well, that's, so that's, that's the big thing about test. I mean, about DR, anyways. If you're going to have yeah. a DR plan, if you don't test it, that's right. That's it's right. not worth the paper it's written on and the the bits it's using. You got to test it. And we're conducting uh, surveys uh, currently, and uh, a lot of people aren't even testing annually. Um, no. And and when they do have an outage, they're going through the aha. We did not update. We did not configure. We did not do this. So their recovery point objectives could be 12 hours plus, you know, when, when it all comes down to it. So they're not getting the protection they're paying for. See, the my, my goal of disaster recovery is literally a guy at a desk during a major disaster issue, major, yeah. where he basically has his feet up on his desk and he's reading a book while the machine just chugs a line, gets a phone call from the CEO. The CEO says, where's my email? I need to get that deal done. And he looks up on the screen and says, 
Yep, the Exchange server is restoring now. It's going to be up and running in about five minutes. Would you like me to put your mailbox to be first restored? Yes, please. Would you like me to have an SMS sent to your phone when it's ready for you? Yes, please. It's like, okay, and expect it in about 30 minutes. Just redirect something on the screen, go back to reading his book. Right now, disaster recovery for the vast majority of companies is a high pressure, intense. Yeah. Everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. And until we get to the point where everything is automated, those mistakes will continue to be made. And, and that's why the API nature of the clouds are really interesting. Because if you, if you can link in and power up in an hour or two a test that otherwise might take three days of your team's time, you're much more conducive to testing. And we, one of our customers, was on a contract and it was a very expensive contract, but it was 30 days notice for a DR test. Now, how comforting is that? I mean, oh, you've got to give 30 days notice of a disaster or an IT outage more commonly. How often does that happen? That's kind of like a pen, hiring a pen tester and telling them don't, don't pen test yet, we're not ready. That's, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like you're either ready or you're not. There's, if you're not ready, you're never going to be ready. That's right, and I have, I have a funny uh, story to share with you. Uh, one of our customers, the CIO, was very interested in kind of the cloud DR approach. And uh, the, one of the IT people was very worried about the security and compliance risk. And so the CIO said, look, I'll let you hire the auditor. And so the, the IT guy was like, hey, this is awesome. I know who to hire. I'm going to bring them in. And about three weeks later, after all this testing and everything, the uh, auditor, the, the, the team is gathered around the table. And the CIO goes, okay, what are the findings? He goes, well, I've got good news and bad news. And the CIO is like, uh-oh. He goes, well, what's the bad news? He goes, well, I found some security and compliance issues in your cloud environment. And he looks at him and goes, well, uh, what could possibly be the good news then? He goes, well, there's a lot fewer than in your native environment. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the truth. Because, I mean, you and I both know um, clouds do security and compliance a whole lot better, like Amazon and, and Azure. And most companies. And Azure. And most companies, they don't have the people, the skills. They, the, yeah. These clouds can hire the folks. The yeah. biggest problem with clouds today, though, is a lot of that's not transparent. It's changing yeah. slowly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Amazon just came out with a bunch of stuff that made it a little bit more transparent. I can now see NetFlow data. I got a little bit more on CloudTrail. And Azure is doing the same thing. But until that becomes 100% transparent, I'm going to need to do some extra stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so this, I was having coffee with a friend who uh, is a chief cloud architect at a, a very, very big name company. And uh, he was saying, what well, we look at the cloud from a standpoint of a really good baseline protection, the walls, and then our investments in security are going to be differentiation inside the cloud. Absolutely. So that's where we're going to invest our money versus replicating the fortress, we're going to have specialized security. Look, if you can get in past, you know, the Amazon or the Azure, you know, et cetera, security, then you're dealing with ours versus trying to replicate. And, it, and he used the story of the two guys in Alaska running from the bear. One guy steps down his tie, tie his shoes and the other guy goes, you're not going to be able to outrun a bear. He goes, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. you know? And so in, in, in terms of, security, no one's going to have perfect security, but if you have better security than others and you're leveraging the investments that the cloud players are making in advanced infrastructure and security and people and making differentiation, you're the one tying your shoes. Yeah. While the other guy's, you know, standing there and you're, you're the person that's got your fort set up outside the major fortress and you're probably more likely to get attacked and broken into. Would be well, and this is this is no different. I mean, if you're talking about migration, or you're talking yeah. about cloud DR, or you're talking about anything, the anything dealing with the cloud. To be honest, you're going to have to do a little bit different planning because you don't have to worry about the same things. You still have to worry about a yeah. lot of the same things. The attacks are the same. Yeah. The, but there's, I mean, when you when you talk about all the big attacks. They're going to be hitting Amazon. They're going to hit, be hitting Azure long before they hit you. Yeah. And if they do hit you, it's because you left something open, and that's that's what you need to audit against your policy for. But, when we, but then that actually begs the question, you're talking about this company. They have a cloud administrator or a cloud architect. Yeah. Are you seeing a lot more companies doing that from a 
grow internally or are they actually trying to hire folks that are trying to be these things? You know, it's hard to tell from our perspective. Our level of automation is such that what we, we find is that the people are pretty impressed with the fact that they don't need that much specialized tools in order to manage the stuff that we do. Um, but I think that... I was just wasn't thinking tools. I was thinking knowledge, specialized knowledge of yeah. the individual. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's a hiring boom going on for people with cloud skills. And, you know, you see some turnover at the cloud providers because once people get educated, they become more valuable very quickly. And I, I would say the biggest move right now is more into the ecosystem of these cloud providers, you know, the integrators and the partners, because they're the people who are really feeling the, the traction and the technical demands. And then I think the companies are building up more slowly in terms of cloud skills. So I was told that about probably about 90% of the cloud business is through partners. And I think the reason is that the partners have the security and the compliance expertise and yeah. all of those. And the companies don't have that in-house expertise yet. So it's kind of a funnel effect that they're the gatekeepers. They're the people that are validating and testing, i.e. the example I used of the CIO, they, they hired an outside security consultant, an expert who understood the cloud and understood the, the traditional security requirements. And those people are probably not as common as, you know. No, they're not. <laughs> yeah. You and I both know that. Is it, I mean, we, yeah. Everybody can say they're a security person, but do they understand yeah. the ins and outs of actually putting applications into the cloud? Do they know the difference between securing the fortress, as you said, versus adding X secondary layers and knowing what you have to pay attention to? Um, there's a lot there. And the models are very, I mean, models that you can follow are very few and far between. Well, I was uh, in this working group with people like uh, Vince Cerf and Lou Tucker and stuff. Years ago, we were meeting at, uh, at SRI on the infrastructure 2.0. And I was there when Chris Hoff, Hoff presented the stack of turtles, which was yep. the security vulnerabilities. And I saw the light bulbs go off of some very smart people in the room. And there was an aha factor of like, oh my gosh, look at all these attack surfaces and planes and access points, holy cow. And ultimately, I mean, between Hoff and, uh, I'm trying to remember uh, uh, Simon Crosby and Neil McDonald. And I mean, that's where the whole idea of virtualization security and the the contrast between how do you protect fluid environments with you know static network appliances? Well, you and don't. Think, <laughs> and, that's right. That's right. That's right. But I think ultimately the cloud is part of the solution to that in terms of the automation and the APIs, because you need to have a higher level of automation in order to protect fluid environments and Absolutely. environments under high rates of change. And if if you think that traditional IT and all the manual processes are going to get you there, um, you know I've interacted with people on LinkedIn through some of our programs and they're kind of like, yeah, but damn it, you know, traditional IT really works and that's how you get security and, you know, and all this. I said, how does that scale? Tell me, once you increase your agility factor, once people can create and spin up things, how the heck do you keep up? Well, we have to hire more people. Yeah, uh, and that's not going to work. No, no. So I'm going to say um, if people, if you're listening to this, if you want to uh, find out more about Cloud Velox, go to www.cloudvelox.com. It is a highly automated solution for migration and Cloud DR and a few other things. Please check them out. Thank you, Greg, for joining us on Virtual Thoughts. Thanks, Edward. Hook them horns.